This is a carb conversion that I've been uh, test driving for an owner in Florida and I'm getting ready to pull it off the car so I can uh, box it up and get a shipping quote. And I thought that uh, in the process it might be fun to make a uh, video showing all the steps uh, necessary to uh, install one of my carb conversions. Um, I did a video a week or two ago showing uh, removal of uh, an intake manifold but that was just the uh, manifold only, manifold and carburetor only. Uh, on this video, I'm going to do everything from the fuel tank uh, to the fuel pump to the manifold and the carburetor. And uh, this will be, you know, kind of like a video instruction manual on how to install one of my carb conversions. I'm going to start with the tank in the front of the car. Um, most owners have a mechanical fuel pump that is mounted to the engine. Uh, I can do an electric fuel pump in the tank if that's what the owner wants. In fact, I got an owner in New Jersey that just uh, asked for a, a uh, electric fuel pump in the tank. But most owners are going to have a mechanical fuel pump mounted to the engine. So what goes in the tank is first of all a baffle. This gets mounted to the stud that's cast into the bottom of the tank and it has little holes drilled around the base of the baffle and what that will do is that will ensure that the uh, pickup stays immersed in fuel as you go around corners and go uphill and things like that and then this is the tank pickup itself this just sticks straight down into the tank that's a 300 micron pickup screen down at the bottom uh, that just filters out the big pieces of trash that tend to accumulate in gas tanks and it's just a tube going up to a hose bar and that will get inserted into the tank and the clamp will get tightened down and then the other end of the hose is going to go to the old K-Jet return line this here is the old K-Jet outbound fuel line that goes through the accumulator and the K-Jet fuel filter and everything else I just have a short little piece of hose and a plug in, in mine and this is the return line. We're going to repurpose the old return line as an outbound fuel line, front to rear fuel line. And that's the factory barb. It's a quarter of an inch. So I'll have a piece of quarter inch hose going between the barb on the pickup and that barb there. And there's the pickup installed in the tank with a piece of quarter inch hose going from the pickup to the old K-Jet return line. Not the original outbound fuel line, but the return line. We are repurposing the old return line as a front to rear fuel line. Let me show you now where the pump is going to go. On the back side of the passenger head is a plate. Underneath this plate is a lobe on the camshaft that every time the camshaft spins around, it will operate the plunger on the mechanical pump. Now ordinarily, everything is held together with bolts. I provide studs and stainless nuts. Uh, I've found that this is not only easier to install, but because the nut is stainless, if you ever need to remove your pump in the future, uh, the two will not rust together. And there's the pump installed on the studs. Now we need to run a piece of quarter inch hose from the end of the old K-Jet return line. Remember, we're repurposing the old K-Jet return line as a front to rear fuel line. So we need to run a piece of quarter inch hose from this barb to the quarter inch barb that's on the top of the pump. And there's the hose. Now we are ready to install the intake manifold and the carburetor. In the uh, other video I removed the intake manifold and the carburetor as a unit which is really the easiest way to do it. Um, and that's also how I ship them. I ship the manifold and the carburetor already bolted together. I just unbolt them from the, the heads 
uh, after test driving. But if you ever want to take the carburetor off of the intake manifold, it's held on by studs in each corner. So all you do is you take off the four nuts on the four studs and then you just lift the carburetor off of the manifold and then when you're ready to put it back on just put the carburetor back on the manifold and put nuts on each stud the heads on my engine were never drilled for fuel injectors so I can't show you the fuel injector plugs in place, but this is what they look like. It's a stainless steel plug, and I also provide new rubber boots, so you have uh, good rubber to make a good tight seal. But these go where the fuel injectors used to be, all six of them. Now we put the intake manifold and the carburetor onto the engine. The manifold is held down by the same four bolt holes that originally held the K-Jet manifold. Uh, go ahead and start the bolts, but don't tighten them all the way down until you've had a chance to kind of wiggle and maneuver the manifold just to make sure it's sitting flush against the heads. Remember also that the bolts are not at a 45 degree angle like the flanges, but they're actually at 22 and a half degrees. The throttle cable bracket mounts directly to the manifold. If this was a Peugeot installation, the throttle cable bracket would actually look like this. It would mount to the back of the adapter plate. So this is a fabricated manifold, and on the fabricated manifolds, they bolt directly to the manifold. Now this is where things are going to get a little bit interesting. You're going to have to cut the outer sheath shorter. The K-Jet outer sheath in the K-Jet installation is going to come to like right about here, which is just way, way, way too long. Uh, anybody who's ever tried to leave the outer sheath the original length and put like a big bend in it or something crazy like that, it does not work at all. All it does is just bind up the inner cable. So the outer cable will need to be cut shorter. Now mine is cut way back here because I sometimes have to test drive uh, Peugeot installations and the Peugeot installation scoots the carburetor towards the rear So when I'm test driving a Peugeot manifold, I have a throttle cable end that looks like this Just like a K-Jet throttle cable end Now this is a fabricated manifold which moves the carburetor towards the middle But my outer sheath of course is way back there So what I have is this long end and that takes up the difference between the two. Now that is on my car only. And only because I have to have the capabilities of driving um, manifolds that put the carburetor in two different locations. So I've cut my outer cable for the Peugeot length way back here. And then when I'm test driving a fabricated manifold, I use this end that takes up the difference. The owner who's getting this installation will probably cut his sheath right here. He will not cut it way back there. He'll cut it much closer to the end of the throttle cable bracket. Alright, I got the uh, throttle ball end and the return spring installed on the cable. But before I tighten this cable stop down, I need to make sure that the carburetor is in its warm choke settings so the throttle plates will be all the way closed. You don't want to set this too short and have it be preventing the throttle plates from closing all the way. And the way you do that, it takes two hands. With one hand, you move the throttle linkage back. By doing that, you're moving the fast idle screw back, and that will allow you to press down on this connection. This is where the rod that connects the fast idle cam to the choke mechanism is. You press this down, and then while holding this, let the throttle cable, the throttle mechanism go. 
The throttle plates are now all the way closed and the fast idle screw is actually stuck up underneath the fast idle cam. In fact, that's the reason that you press on the accelerator pedal when you're starting a carbureted engine. It's not to prime the engine. Everybody says, ooh, you got to prime the engine. No, you don't need to prime the engine. What you need to do is to move the fast idle screw out of the way so the fast idle cam can rotate back to its cold settings and then you know you can let the throttle linkage go in fact I'm gonna do it right now watch what happens when I move this throttle mechanism out of the way you're gonna see two things happen first of all this choke plate is going to flip closed and then you're also going to see the connection to the fast idle cam move up and you don't have to pump the shit out of it all you got to do just take the tension off of it now not only is the choke plate fully closed ready to start the engine but you'll notice that the connection to the fast idle cam has now moved up now I'm going to put it back into its warm choke settings and tighten that cable stop now it's time to connect the hoses uh, this is a straight drive so it has two hoses in the back if this was an automatic it would have three this only has two. 5 sixteenths is PCV. That goes to the PCV passages in the carb base. And then 3 eighths is full manifold vacuum going to HVAC brake booster. If this was an automatic conversion, there'd be a third hose back here, 3 sixteenths of an inch, and that would be going to the modulator valve in the front of the automatic transmission. But this is a straight drive, so it only has two. The PCV hose, this is the PCV valve. The brass end goes towards the oil filler cap, and then the valve itself goes towards the carburetor, the PCV passages in the carb base. If you have any questions, just try to blow through that valve in the two different directions. And what you'll discover is that you can only blow in this direction. And that will make sure you get it oriented correctly. And then the great big 5 8 hose, this is the breather for the PCV. This hose has a spring inside of it because it makes kind of a wicked bend. And if you don't have that spring inside of it, it'll kink. So the 5 8 hose is the breather. And then this is a 3 16 hose here that goes from the um, ported vacuum barb that's on the side of the throttle plates directly to the spark advanced diaphragm in the back of the distributor and then the last thing you have is 12 volts keyed to ignition going to the choke heater to heat up the spring inside the choke mechanism so that's all the hoses that you have 3 16 going directly to the spark advanced diaphragm. It's already ported from the side of the throttle plates. 5 eighths is the breather. And then 5 sixteenths is the PCV. And that's your PCV valve. And then that's the other end of the PCV line going into the carb base. And then 3 eighths is HVAC brake booster. It goes to the T where those two split. And if this was an automatic conversion, there'd be a 3 sixteenths hose back there going to the modulator valve. Now I've installed the fuel filter and the metal fuel line. So I'm ready to fill the carburetor with fuel and start the engine. This is the fuel filter. It screws into the front of the carburetor. This is the metal fuel line. This is a flare connection between the two. This is 11 sixteenths on the filter, half inch on the fuel line, the flare nut. Use two wrenches to lock the flare together. And the fuel line continues around to the pump. You can use a metal fuel line on the engine because the pump does not move relative to the carburetor. But you have to use a rubber fuel line from the pump to the frame because the engine does move independently of the frame. That's standard practice. Now the carburetor right now is empty. There's no fuel inside of it. 
Now we could crank the engine until it has a chance to move the fuel from the front of the car to the back of the car. Or here's a little helpful hint. You can fill the carburetor manually. I'm going to use that chimney through the chimneys. Just put a little funnel in there. And then I have found that one spray can cap is a good amount of fuel to fill the carburetor with. So you can fill the carburetor manually like this. Now the carburetor is full of fuel and the engine should start if I can find the right key. Sorry about that, I didn't have the keys. All right, in theory, it should start. And it does. Very first thing to do is check for fuel leaks. Your fingers come out dry. driving on the highway, you know, under load, moving a car around. So, 